it's always so much fun for me to talk to a crowd like this. And I get asked to, do, uh, to, to speak quite a bit. And, um, but when I, can, when I have a chance to talk to the kids themselves with their parents in the audience, there's something very special. Because you parents are going to learn something tonight. Guys, your mom and dad are going to learn something tonight, and it's going to help you. And you're going to learn something that I, as a parent, learned over the past nine years. And my goal tonight is to take you through a story. And it's my story, and it's my family's story. But I hope when, this, when, 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 when I conclude tonight that all of you, not just you kids, but also mom and dad, maybe look in the mirror slightly differently tonight. Maybe look in the mirror with a little more hope, with a little more shalom. Because that's what's happened to me over these past nine years. And I didn't expect it. So I'm going to start by introducing my family. Team Troutwine, this is my lovely wife, Susie. We have four kids, Will, Tommy, Michael, and Holland. We live in Johns Creek. I'm from Chicago area originally. My wife's from Philadelphia originally. We've been here over 20 years now. I went to Northwestern University. I played baseball there. And um, my wife, Susie, went to University of Virginia, where she played both field hockey and lacrosse. So perhaps she's the real athlete in the family. After I graduated from Northwestern, I actually signed with the Montreal Expos. That tells you how old I am. <laughs> they don't exist anymore. However, they just won the World Series disguised as the Washington Nationals. <laughs> True story. Um, so I spent most of my time in the minor leagues, but I did uh, have one very, very fun year in the big leagues with the Boston Red Sox in 1988 and a little bit in 89 and 90. If you guys Google me, you'll be really disappointed. I really wasn't that good. <laughs> but it was really fun, and I had a ton of teammates. I had so many teammates starting when I was three years old, all the way I finished playing baseball, I was 29. So many teammates. And Susie had so many teammates throughout her sports career. But I also found that I had so many teammates even when I wasn't playing sports. I had teammates in my youth group. I had teammates in the band. I had teammates in scouts. I had teammates with my family. I had teammates with my cousins. And, and so Susie and I always had this very teammate approach to our parenting. If you, uh, my kids heard every teammate cliche you could ever want to hear. Good teams win and great teams love each other and your, your brothers are your teammates and, and you need to love your teammates on and off the field. And, and then when, when our daughter was born, all of a sudden your sister's your teammate and you got to love her on and off the field as well. And we have a happy home. We have a fun home. My marriage with, with Susie has always been wonderful. She's nuts about me. <laughs> and I'm nuts about her. And, and if you ask the people in, in our neighborhood about the trout wines, uh, yeah, they'll say, yeah, they've got it going. I have a fun job. I work for a, 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 an IT services company in Lawrenceville. I get to travel a bit. We have a happy home. And our neighbors would tell you that, yeah, the trout's they're, they're living the dream. Well, the dream crashed exactly nine years and one month ago when our oldest child, our son Will, who was a freshman at Northview High School at the time, was 15, he took his life. He was big. He was strong. He was successful. He was handsome. He was funny. He was smart. He was a good athlete. He was a good student. He was an unbelievable musician. Boy, would he would have loved what I just witnessed with you guys. He was one of those guys that truly rejoiced in the success of his friends. It's a very rare trait. He was much better at that than I was. I wanted the ball. I was the pitcher. Give me the ball. I'm the man. I'm the guy. Will wanted to make somebody else better. I wanted to sing 
the melody. Will wanted to be somebody's harmony. He wanted to make the melody of his friends sound better. And his friends loved him for it. And he had an army of friends. And they were devastated when he died. We were so devastated. We were so shocked that we thought somebody came into our house and murdered him. That's how clueless we were that, that this seemingly happy boy was struggling in any way, shape, or form. The night before he died, we, we went to Verrazano's Pizza in Johns Creek, and, and I tested him on, 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 on his geology test that he was going to take the next day. He had 20-some note cards. He knew the answer of every single one. I said, wow, Will, you know your stuff today. He said, yeah, Dad, I'm going to ace this one. During that dinner, he said, Dad, on Saturday, I'm going to ref lacrosse over at Newtown Park. It starts at noon. Can we get up early so that we can go get our, my driver's permit? He took his life the day before he was going to get his driver's permit. Mom, am I getting my braces off next week or the week after? Notice later on in his life, he didn't show his teeth too much. Four years of wearing braces were coming off next week. Dad, on Halloween, two weeks' time, my band, we're going to play. We're going to play live in our cul-de-sac. Check out this song list. And he gave me a list of songs. Of course, I didn't know any of them. But he was excited about tomorrow, literally tomorrow. And if you would have told me that my boy was sad, if you'd have told me that my boy was not okay, I would have told you you were crazy. He's a trout wine. He's fine. He's great. Look at him. I would have been offended if somebody would have told me he had depression. And if Will would have told me he had depression or was sad or something not right, I would have talked him out of it. And he knew that. So he didn't tell me. And, and when, he, when he passed, people started coming out of the woodwork that very weekend. People started telling me stories about depression and anxiety and mental illness and suicide and attempted suicides in their lives. People that I'd known for a long time, people who were pretty close to me and my family were telling me about their roommate or their brother or their sister or their, or their friend. Your, your brother tried to, tried to kill himself and I've known you for 10 years and you never told me that? Oh, we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it? What do you mean you don't talk about it? Oh, we don't talk about it. We're not allowed to. I don't understand. What, what do you mean you're not going to... And, 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 and the, these, these beautiful, wonderful uh, organizations and, and counseling areas that are all over this area started calling me and handing me cards and because, because this happens all the time. And I had no idea that one in six, one in six of you kids suffer from some sort of anxiety, depression, or other diagnosable mental illness. And guess what? It's okay. One in six of your mom and dad suffer from it. One in six of your grandparents. One in six of every person you ever met in your life suffer from some sort of diagnosable mental illness. It's treatable, it's beatable, it's common, it's curable, and it's okay if we talk about it. Will never talked about it. I never talked about it. I didn't know to talk about it. I didn't know that every 13 minutes in America somebody takes their life and every two hours in America it's a teenager. I had no idea. I didn't know that one in ten of the college kids that you all know have already have a plan of how they're going to take their life. Nobody knows this. And because I was so unaware and because I was so uneducated, my son died. I'm convinced of that. That happy, successful, well-to-do family in this area is the face of mental illness. And nobody knows this. Well, they know it now. Or at least I'm trying to make it known now. And I remember thinking, you know, an illness is something 
that, that needs to be treated. When, when I was pitching and I had a sore arm, I, I, I took medication and I went to therapy, physical therapy. Depression is, is a, actually a physical deformity in the brain. And, and you go to therapy and there's medication. It's an illness and it needs to be treated because an illness that doesn't get treated can lead to a tragedy. But it also has this stigma and it also has this maskable capability. Will had what was called a functional depression. He could hide it because he didn't want his dad to know because he wanted his dad to think he was strong and happy. He didn't want to disappoint me. And I never gave him the chance and I remember thinking, we've got to find a way to talk about it, and how am I going to do this, and how am I going to get through this? It didn't take long. Three days after, three days after he died, we had his funeral. Our small little church in Johns Creek couldn't hold the crowd, so we had to go to the big Johns Creek Baptist Church. There was 2,000 people there, and I stood up there, and I eulogized my boy, the the. the the, the creature who made me the greatest thing that I could ever be, a dad. And I stood there, and the entire left-hand side of the church was dominated by Will's friends and their, in their, in his teammates in their lacrosse jerseys. And I was talking to them, and I was almost preaching to them about how Will just loved being with you guys and to honor him and, and by loving each other. Just love each other, boys. Be there for each other. Talk to each other, because we all are not okay. And as I was talking and as I was explaining how Will was, was more interested in being on the team than he was about winning, I started to pick out people in the crowd that I knew. There's Mark Savard. He was the other guard on my seventh grade basketball team in Barrington, Illinois, 30, 40 years ago. There's Jimmy Bartels. He was my first baseman on my little league team when I was nine. There's Tick and Fife and Scooch and Fran. There's my high, guys on my high school football team. There's guys on my, 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 Randy Karen and I played the trumpet in the band. John Loomis and I were in a youth group together. And I started to see these guys in the audience. And, and Susie saw the same. Her, her teammates were in town. And they had come to be with me. And while I was speaking. Somehow, somehow I was thinking, oh my gosh, I know what I'm going to do. I know how I'm going to get people to talk. Because when I saw these guys, well, now, now it's going crazy, isn't it? <laughs> you guys got to stop me. When I saw these guys, I saw my life friends, the guys that I, that I sat in the dugout with, the guys that I had the, 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 the crazy youth group guys, the youth group ministers with. The guys, the guys that, that I shared all my first with. My life friends. Every groomsman in my wedding was there. Every godfather to my kids were there. And every single one of these guys, these life friends, I met when I was Will's age. When I was your age age. Oh, had Will just realized that he'd already met his groomsmen, he's met his life friends. You girls have already met girls that will stand up for you in your wedding and your bridesmaids. You boys have met guys that will be in your wedding for you. I'm convinced of it. Your hubby might be in the room. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No. Stranger things have happened. Ask your mom and dad tonight about the, their bridal party and when they met them and how old they were. Mom and Dad, you want to have a nice little dinner conversation? Talk about your wedding party. They're interested. They're not interested in telling you how their day was. That's a fact. And you all know that. Because whenever I ask my kids how their day was, I get the, yeah. How's practice? Yeah. How'd you do the test? Yeah. Did you talk to the teacher? Yeah. Right? Guys, how was your day? I was at school. How do you think my day was? It was brutal. I don't want to talk about school. I just spent eight hours there. Let's talk about something else. 
Let's talk about you. Let's talk about who was in their wedding. Let's talk about their best friends and what they shared when they were your age because they're sharing with them still today. And that's what happened to me. Those guys picked me up. They carried me through the darkest times of my life. They gave me hope because they understood me. Who really understands you guys the best? Your mom, your dad, or your best friends? Much to the chagrin of your parents, it's your best friends. Nobody loves you like your parents. Nobody does. But nobody truly understands you than the guys and gals sitting next to you in the youth group and on the class and in the dugout and in the sidelines. And that is a good thing. Will's friends were devastated with his death. They were devastated. They still are today. And, and, and they wish they would have talked to him more. But they didn't know to talk to him more. They didn't know that it was okay to not be okay. Will didn't know it was okay to not be okay because I never told him. Because I'm a typical parent and I can't stand to see my kids not okay. I have to make them okay, and I have to make them okay now, right this minute. And I realized that if I can start a foundation that gets you guys to recognize the love and the hope that you have in each other, then maybe I can get you guys to also talk a little bit more and be a little more comfortable about saying, yeah, I'm not okay. Because life is hard right now. And I think when the foundation started, I got asked to speak. And I would, I would speak mostly to sports teams. And, and occasionally, I think one of the first speeches I gave was the FCA group at Northview High School. And, and the kids were really listening. They were really paying attention. Nobody took their phones out. And I'd give these 45-minute speeches, and they just were like, wow. And I learned something because I was spending so much time with these, with these kids. Most of them were in high school at the time. And you know what I learned? It's really hard to be you today. You don't hear that very often, do you? You all have it harder than I did when I was your age. You have it harder than your mom or your dad or your grandparents or your, or your ministers or your scouting groups, your band teachers, your counselors. Every trusted adult in your life did not have it as hard as you did today. If you all could see their faces, you know what they're saying right now? I love you. <laughs> because they don't hear this. Not once did I ever say to my son, wow, dude, this is hard. Isn't this great, Will? Isn't this awesome? Look at this church. Look at these facilities. Look at you get to travel baseball and you're only 12 years old. You're going to Charlotte for the weekend. My first travel, I was in college. This is awesome, Will. Isn't this great? Isn't this cool? Isn't this wonderful? Not one time they say, wow, this is hard. And sometimes when I, when I speak, I, I, I see it in the crowd, especially with the parents, and usually it's a dad. And, and they're saying, well, okay, hold on, hold on. You're telling me that my son, who lives in this really nice big house and, 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 and these wonderful facilities, and I walked in the snow uphill with no shoes both ways every day of my life and all the things, right? All the trials and tribulations that we all had when we were their age. And I'll say, yeah, I am. And, they go, I, and then I'll say, Dad, did you have this? And he says, no, I win. What comes with this, what comes with the internet, what comes with social media and this 24-7 negative world is nothing like what I faced when I was your age. I played three varsity sports in high school and I had dinner every single night with my family at 6.30. If somebody wanted to get a hold of me, this thing, this thing on the wall would like ring. And my dad had a big cord and my dad would pick it up and he'd, hello, now he's eating, boom. I didn't miss anything. I didn't, I, I didn't know to miss anything. The world was, sh I was shut, the outside world was shut off to me till tomorrow morning and it was perfectly fine. Nothing like it is today. And I never really realized that. 
And this whole time I kept saying to Will, isn't this great? Isn't this awesome? Isn't this wonderful? With every positive syllable that I uttered, it made it harder for him to talk to me. It made it harder for him to say, no, I'm not okay, because he knew I would just talk him out of it. And as I think about the pressures, the, the athletic, the academic, the social, it's unlike what we had. You look at all of those schools there. Will was a freshman. The, the University of Georgia came to Northview and said, you better take a bunch of AP classes and you better get A's in them if you want to get into Georgia. He, Will was 15. We weren't even talking about college. Dad went to Northwestern University, one of the finest academic institutions in the country, and his mom went to University of Virginia, also one of the finest academic. He's not going to get into Georgia because he's not even in high ability, let alone TAG or, or AP. By the way, that comment about having to get straight A's in AP classes to go to Georgia is not true. Tommy's, my son Tommy's at Georgia right now, didn't take any AP classes. But I'll tell you this, guys, there is not enough spaces. There just isn't. The world has gotten smaller. It's easier for kids from all over the world to come and go to Georgia or come and go to Georgia Tech or go to any one of these schools. But you know what? I've been an executive of my company for over 20 years. Every year I interview four, five, six people looking for jobs. I'm doing it right now. We're looking for a couple sales guys. Not one time, guys, have I ever said in an interview, so what did you get in AP Lit when you were a sophomore <laughs> at South Forsyth? Oh, a B. Oh, that's going to hurt you. <laughs> It doesn't happen. Not one time in my life has anyone ever asked me my grade point average. Never. Guys, it's not the school. It's you, and it's you, and it's you. I look at how you look me in the eye. I look at how you shake my hand. I look at how you answer the really ridiculous question that made no sense. I want to see what your sense of urgency is like. I want to know, are you going to come in early? Are you going to stay late when you make a mistake? Are you going to own it? What do your teammates say about you? What do your friends say about you? What do your partners say about you? I can't get that from a Harvard degree or a piece of paper that says I went to Harvard or Georgia or Georgia Tech or Kennesaw. I can't. They're all good schools. And yes, we want to go to the best school we can. And yes, we want to stay and stay because you have the Hope Scholarship and it's a big deal. And I'm totally serious. It is. I don't have the solution. But I'm more aware because society is crushing them with this. And you need to understand it, even in seventh grade, they're getting told this. It's hard, it's really hard. And I'm so impressed with you all. I'm so impressed the way you navigate through this craziness. And when you get that letter that says you didn't get in, it's not because you're not any good. There's just not enough spaces. And when your friend gets that letter, I want you to remember me. I want you to tell them, remember when, when Mr. Troutwine spoke? It's not Georgia. It's you. When you stand at the altar and, and you say your vows with the, the greatest friends in your life standing next to you, and you turn around and, and with, with, your, with your spouse and you see that congregation and you walk down, not one of you is going to say, I can't believe I didn't get into Georgia. <laughs> but you know what? When that letter comes, it's going to suck. It's going to be awful. It's going to be brutal. It's going to be hard. But you're not alone in this. And I beg of you to think of that. And, and then I, th I think about, I think about ath athletic Right? When I, I stood on the mound at Fenway Park. I don't make the South Forsyth baseball team now. You know why? Because when I was 11, I wouldn't have made the travel team. Because when I was 11, I was kind of a dork. But back in 1975, the world was patient. The world allowed me to grow up. And I gained 100 pounds and grew six inches in my high school and didn't even play my junior year and got a full ride scholarship because of my senior year. They're committing to schools as freshmen now. Never thought of this. I, didn't, I really wasn't aware of it. Dad played in the big leagues. I, I, I can't even make the travel team, right? I, 
I wasn't aware of what Will could possibly be thinking. I never asked him these questions. And then the whole social thing. I, when Debbie Feeker dumped me, and she so regrets that now. <laughs> and I'm not bitter about it. Nobody tweeted it. it. My relationship status didn't change on Facebook. When Will died, all they had was Facebook. His did change. Dude, she broke up with you. What? Yeah, it's on Facebook. Nothing. Nothing like we had to go through. I never thought about that. Again, I don't have the solution. People ask me, so what should we do about the phones? I don't know. You could put them in a jar at 8 o'clock and say, no more screens. Watch them freak out. Watch them. What am I missing? What am I missing? What am I missing? What am I missing? Or you can let them have it all night and have them do this all night. They're both awful, but I wasn't aware of it. I never talked about it. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to raise this awareness that these guys have it hard. You still have to do it, but understand you're not alone. And understand that the people sitting next to you understand this because they have to do it too. And the issues and problems that exist on this side, they also exist over here. So don't be afraid to say, hey, I'm not okay. I wish Will would have done that once, and I wish I would have created an atmosphere that allowed him to do it. Because I do know this, if they have a place to go, if they have that friendship, those life teammates that are there for them, you all have these friends right now. And by the way, you also know people who might not. You know people that just moved here that don't have that friendship. Maybe reach out to them. Maybe be their harmony. Maybe give them, give yourself to them. Because this concept of a life teammate is a good one, but sometimes it can be a challenge. So there's Club Will to Lives at schools all over here. There's, I think there's, there's one in South Forsyth. I don't, I don't know if there's that many in Forsyth County. I know there's a bunch in Northview and you guys want to start a club, will to live, do it. It's a place to talk. Because who better understands how hard it is to be a seventh grader, an eighth grader, or a freshman, or a junior in any of these schools than your classmates? And that's what the foundation's promoting, you guys, to talk together. Because you have friends that struggle. And when you hear of a friend that struggles, I want you to act. I want you to acknowledge, care, and tell. ACT. The stop, drop, and roll of friends who are struggling. You acknowledge that it's hard. I just told you how hard it is. I just agreed with you how hard it is. So agree with them. I understand that you're struggling. Care, be that life teammate that shows them the good that they can't see. And the T is to talk about it. Talk about it with them. Talk to a trusted adult. Who, is the, who are those adults in your lives? This is also a little nice dinner table conversation. Who are the adults in your lives other than mom and dad that you would want to talk to if you were struggling. Maybe it's Rocky. Maybe it's your grandmother. Maybe it's a counselor. Maybe it's a teacher. Think it through. Have a plan. There are adults in your lives other than your family that love you to death. That's the beauty of all of this. Who are your life teammates and do they know? Here's a challenge for you all. Here's your homework. All of you are getting married this coming Saturday, okay? Your wedding day is this coming Saturday, and you all have six or seven bridesmaids and groomsmen. Who are they? Great dinner table conversation. You wanna get your kids to talk? Tell them you're getting married on Saturday. Who's gonna stand up there with them? And if you have siblings, it's hilarious. <laughs> I did it with Tommy and Michael. They're like, yeah, not him. Michael said, I'm in your wedding. No, you're not. And I looked at Susie. Well, they're talking. <laughs> who would stand up there with you? Who are those life teammates? Who are those friends in your lives that you want to make sure they talk to you when they're not feeling well? And then when you think of who they are, I want you to think of this next question. Do they know? Do they know how much they mean to you? Do they know that you love them? Make sure that they do. You'll feel better.
It's a very interesting concept that I'm learning on a daily basis. Your friends have the ability to show you hope when you can't see it. And we're going to have some fun with this. So take, pay attention to this screen. Back in 1988, it was my third day pitching for the Red Sox. My first two games I had done really well. We're playing the Oakland A's. Mark McGuire, that's Jose Canseco. Mark McGuire is up. Up until now, I was awesome. I'm the man. I'm thinking, this is, this is easy. I can't look. Yeah. More than the monster. I hate Mark McGuire. Is that, is that bad of me? Rocky, you need to help me with this. I shouldn't hate anybody. I gotta love my enemies, don't I? <laughs> okay, that ball went over the green monster. It went over the, the netting, which is 60 feet above the green monster. It went over Lansdowne Street on the other side of the green monster. It went over the bars on the other side of Lansdowne Street. And it landed somewhere in the middle of the mass turnpike. Guys, you're looking at the guy who gave up the longest home run in the history of Fenway Park. Thank you very much. That sucked. <laughs> there was nothing good about that. It was the ESPN play of the game. They showed it a thousand times. My neck was hurting from just a boom, boom. Oh. My dad called me. My friends called me. Everybody was like, wow. And my dad's like, what, what the heck pitch was that? You're embarrassing the family. <laughs> and I remember being so upset. They're going to send me back down to the minors. I'm going to end up in, back in Pawtucket. I was tired of being in Pawtucket. And, and I worked so hard to get the big leagues. And now I've given up this moonshot. And everybody's laughing. And it's just... There was nothing good about it, and I was a mess. And the next day, I had lunch with my very best friend from high school, who I sat, I sat in rooms like this with. His big brother, Al, my friend was Paul. Paul's big brother, Al, who was like a big brother to me, was at the game. I left him tickets. He was in Boston on business. I left him and three of his colleagues to come see the game. And we went to lunch the next day. And I am miserable. I'm a mess. And he says to me, John, I, I, know you're, I know you're struggling. I know you're, I know you're frustrated, but can I ask you a question? I'm like, yeah. He goes, is it safe to say that when you were a kid, you dreamed about striking somebody out in the major leagues? I'm like, what? He goes, John, you heard me. I'm like, okay, yes. John, you did that last night. And I was there. I was in the stands and I saw my little brother's best friend who I used to throw wiffle ball to when he was 10. I saw him in a Red Sox uniform standing on Fenway Park get his first major league strikeout. I was so proud of you. I was so excited for you. I was excited for me. It was an awesome, awesome moment. I had tears in my eyes and his buddies were like, yeah, he was. I was crying because it meant so much to see a kid from Barrington, Illinois, now pitching on, on the Fenway Park, get that first major league strikeout. He was so happy for me. He was so excited for me. You know what I said to him? I did? I had no idea. I completely missed the fact that I had achieved a, a lifelong dream by getting my, my first strikeout against, against a guy named Stan Javier, the Oakland A's. I actually got my first and second strikeout that night. So I went back to the locker room and I dug up the video because I didn't believe it. It's much more fun for me to watch that. So, kind of a silly analogy, but I think you guys get my point. There's always good. Sometimes you need a friend to show it to you. And, and Al Tickey was that friend. And, and as a result, I, I, I went and I, and, I, and I looked at this and I saw these two pictures. And the first one is the home run right down the middle, belt high. My way of saying Merry Christmas, Mark. <laughs> and then the, uh, the, my pitching coach, Bill Fisher, said, Trout Wine, don't throw the ball down the middle to Mark McGuire. 
Thank you, coach. That was a brilliant piece of coaching right there. The strikeout is outside corner. It's lower. It's, he's off balance. I fooled him. My teammate said, Trout, what was that pitch you struck out Javier on? I said, it was a, you know, a sinker. He goes, dude, you're awesome at that. Throw that more often. What are you doing throwing, the, what are you doing throwing this one? He goes, well, it was, you know, it was three and one, and I, I didn't want it to move to my, no, 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 no. Go with what got you here. What is it that you do really well and, and play off that? Stop throwing four-seam fastballs. You need to throw your sinking fastball, which is a two-seam. That's you, John. That was coaching. He found something positive in a very negative thing, and, and, it, and it basically taught me something, and it was, yep, we all have to learn from our mistakes. You're going to have teachers that, that say this, and it's true. Failures and mistakes are learning experiences. Root cause analysis, corrective action, preventive maintenance, continuous measurement. You need to do it, guys. Learn, people, learn. Learn from your mistakes. Learn, learn, learn. Eat, sleep, and drink as well. You want to be great? Find out what it is you do well and do it more often. Find out what you do that, that, that you love to do and incorporate into your life. That's something that the foundation started to teach me because I thought, why am I so... I have a full-time job. I've been doing it for 20 years. And, and whenever I do anything for Will to live, I'm on fire. Look at me. Do I look like a guy who lost his son to, to depression and suicide? I've got a bounce in my step. I'm into this. I'm making you guys laugh. I'm having fun. You know why? Because I'm good at this. I am in my zone. I love it. I woke up this morning knowing that I was going to talk to you guys. And I would, I've been pumped about it all day. And I started to think about my real job, and I thought, I never feel this way. <laughs> and I thought, well, why? I'm sitting behind a desk, and I'm looking at a spreadsheet, and I'm analyzing a report. I'm the I'm chief customer officer. I'm a relationship guy. I need to be out seeing my customers. I need to be talking to my employees. I need to be developing good relationships, because that's what I do, and I do it well. And I need to find people to work for me that love looking at spreadsheets and analyzing reports. They actually exist. It's interesting. <laughs> do you guys see what I'm trying to say to you? What is it that you love to do? What is it that you're really good at? And try to do it a little bit more often. And I found myself, I actually like my job right now. I have visited more customers in the last five years than I did in the 15 years before. And it's, it's worked. It helps. Why does this customer love us but this customer doesn't love us. Oh, well, we make mistakes for this customer. Well, no, we make mistakes for that customer, too. What are we doing here that's different? That's not happening here. I'm getting A's in four of my classes, and I'm getting a C in Spanish. What's not happening in Spanish that is happening there? Maybe I can learn from the successes. And it's a, it's a whole different approach to this, this concept of, of learning from what it is that we do well. From a, from a positive passion, you're going to have more fun doing it, but I think you actually have an opportunity to be better. This kid's a great student. If I would have come home with that report card, my dad would have said, do not come home with a C. You're not eating tonight. You got a C. Get that out of here. But that was 1975. It was a different world. I guess what I'm trying to say to you guys, that kid's a great student. But something's not happening here. So think of it. What's happening in the classes that I do well, and how can I incorporate it in these others? Because sometimes it's the little things. And I think that's something that I learned throughout this, is that every day, every day, I have that strikeout. Every day, there's a base hit. Sorry, you're going to get baseball analogies from me. I don't have to wait for the home run anymore to be happy. And sometimes my friends would show me these little things, these, these smiles that happened each day and help me get through that tragedy. And I'll come back to that in a minute because it changed my life. And I look over here, this concept of, of a positive passion. You saw, it, you saw it with Rocky during the songs. He was in his zone. He had it going. Positive passion. I love it. What do you think that coach is saying to that player? I think, I think he's saying, 
hey, dude, I'm really proud of you. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Don't you? You think that's what he's saying there? And, I, and the, well, the first time I gave a, a speech to the, I gave a speech to the FCA coaches. There's 350 coaches there. And I remember thinking, okay, I need to, I need to um, figure out what separated those great coaches from mine. And I counted that I had over 200 coaches in my life from, from when I was playing little league ball all the way through college and pro ball. And each team had four or five coaches, right? You add up and I'm, I'm counting them. I had 206 coaches. Six of them get Christmas cards from me. And those guys that get Christmas cards from me gave me that face all the time. They were hard on me. They were tough on me. But they gave me that face not only when I did poorly, but also when I did well. They would come up to me and say, Trout White, you finally boxed out and you got the rebound. I'm proud of you. Way to go. Keep it going. Don't stop. All right? Way to go. <laughs> you all right? <laughs> all right and they're spitting on me and they're dropping F-bombs in the middle of it. And all. I'm like, oh my, right? But they were passionate. They were truly happy. And they gave me this feeling that they really wanted me to do well. And they basically showed me that they loved me. And those six guys get Christmas cards. Those are the guys that I come back my, that Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Those are those teachers that I come back and visit. I want them to know how I'm doing. I want them to be proud. And when I talk to coaches, when I talk to teachers, I ask them about that. Are your kids coming back to you? Do they want you to know how they're doing? Because you inspired them. You motivated them. You saved some of your passion for positive because sometimes it's really awesome when you get a B. Because life is just, there's curveballs coming all the time. And this concept of, of learning to live life by a thousand smiles is a good one. And I'll talk about that in a minute because that really changed my life when I started thinking about it. I love this picture. It was taken... Three years, three, sorry, three months before Will died. It's just a nice feel to it. Will knew that I loved him. He and I had a, a really great relationship. When his girlfriend broke up to, with him, I was there. I was always there. I was always positive. I was always motivational. Positive motivation was my style. It still is my style today. I hugged him. I told him about Debbie Feeker and how she dumped me, broke my heart, and now she regrets it. And look at your mom. She's hot. You're going to be fine. I made him laugh. I got him through this. I wiped a tear from his eye. And I was just, I was, I was winning that Father of the Year award. And I walked away. I'm not fine, Dad. In fact, I want to die. He didn't say that. He didn't say anything like that because he knew what he would get from me if he did. He'd get the stories. He'd get my examples. How I turned out great. How everything's fine. You'd be just like me. All these problems, all the problems that you have, your parents have had them. I couldn't stand him to be not okay, and he knew it. So he said, I'm okay. Two years later, after he was gone, his brother Tommy had a girlfriend. He was like maybe a sophomore and junior in high school now. They were struggling. And I could tell he wasn't happy. I'm like, what's going on, Tom? He said, yeah, Chandler and I are breaking up. I said, oh, that sucks. What are you going to do? which was very hard for me to do. I wanted to tell him about all the girls. I want to tell him about Debbie. I want to tell him how he turned out great. Look at your mom. She's hot. I wanted to go through the whole thing. <laughs> but I didn't. I just said, oh, I'm 50. I, I, I don't know how to help you here. I, I don't know anything about young love. Do you have a friend you, you can talk to? He's like, I don't know. I said, I don't know. That's what I would do. Maybe Tommy, someone else can probably counsel you better than I could. I just, it was so long ago for me. I said, yeah. I didn't have an answer. I hugged him. I told him I loved him. And I walked away. And with every muscle in my body, I wanted to go back there and make him okay. Because he was not okay. 
and I wanted to make him okay because I couldn't stand to see him not okay. And, and Susie's grabbing me. She wouldn't let me go. I said, all right. The next day, I get a text from Tommy. It's like four in the afternoon. I never get a text from him during the day. I'm at work, and he says, Dad, Chandler and I had a great talk. Everything's fine. Thank you so much for the talk last night. I said, that sucks, and I don't know. Greatest piece of fathering I ever did. Guys, we have no idea. We just love you. There's no classes for parenting. We just don't know. We just want you to be okay, and it's hard for us to see you not okay. But what I'm trying to do is get the conversation going. I want you guys to be patient with your mom and dad because they're just like me. They just want you to be okay. And they can see, they can see the future that you can't. And mom and dad, I just want you to understand that it's okay for them to not be okay. And it's really hard, but it is okay. And I think that's this message because you have friends that are also not okay. Make sure you give them that message. And when you do that, you're also telling them that you're there for them and you're here for them and that you love them. And there's not a greater thing you could do for a friend than to tell them that you love them. And I think that's what's just so interesting. I, a trusted adult knows and shows that it's hard. And he knows and shows that it's okay to not be okay. And Will never said to his friends, yeah, my dad gets me. He said, my dad loves me. But he never said that. And that one hurts a little. But because of that, I've learned. And, and, and Tommy and Michael and Holland, they... they, they they get a different me now. Maybe that was Will's gift to them. But they do think that I understand them because I, I, I let them not be okay. And it's a very difficult thing for us to do. But I challenge you guys to work with your mom and dad on this. And together you can, you can build this relationship. And if I can improve the relationships with your mom and with your dad, I'm going to improve your will to live. And that's why I'm here. I am not here to stop suicide. I am not here to stop depression. I am here to improve the will to live. Think of it that way, guys. We all have curveballs. We all have issues. Every single friend you know has part of their lives where they're not okay. So remember that before you give that comment or give that criticism. Remember that and give them that compliment because a compliment from a friend means so much more than a compliment from a teacher or a coach. And a criticism can be so much more devastating. And I challenge you guys to do that. You know, through these nine years, this saying, as a minister in, in Washington, D.C., talks about attitude. And, you know, 10% of life is what happens to you, and 90% is how you react to it. And I remember loving that, being a positive guy. I'm like, great, I'm going to be 90. I'm going to be in that 90. I'm going to find a way to be in that 90. And he stopped me. And he said, don't forget the 10. It's not 199, it's 10. 10% 10 of a day is 2.4 hours. That's a long time. But the point was, it is okay to not be okay. Give yourself that 10. But that 90 is, is what, what happened to me is where, this is where God came into the picture and it was pretty quick. And, he, and he, he showed me the 90 almost instantly, the day that Will died. He showed me that love heals. On the day that Will died, I was suffering the worst tragedy that any parent could ever suffer. And on that same day, I was the recipient of more love than any other day of my life and more caring, and more kindness, and more hope than in any other day. I also was more aware of it than in any other day. And I started to see the love. And I started to go where the love was. And it got me through. And when I had a bad day, I would go where the love was, whether it was a friend, or a teammate, or my wife, or my kids. I went where the love was. And, and the foundation started, and I, and I talk about Will was, he was number 13, and his, his friends would say, remember 13. And my buzz line was, remember 13 and love each other. 
and, and, and if I can get you guys to say I love you, I can get you guys to say I'm struggling. And so it became this big thing, remember 13 and love each other. And we got kids to say I love you, man, and all this fun stuff. And I remember being asked, to, that, same, that same fellowship of Christian athletes, I was asked to speak to these guys, and I was like the third speaker, and the first two guys were, were young kids, you know, uh, not necessarily kids, young men, 22 years old, baseball players and pro ball, who had just found Christ. And they were, they were Tim Tebow on steroids. <laughs> they were quoting the Bible left and right. I'm like, oh boy, I know that Charlie Brown and they were in the city of David, keeping watch over their flock. By, you know, I, I'm not a student of the Bible. My faith has always been strong. I have always been a believer. I, I ask God and Jesus to be with me every single day. Just be with me. If you're with me, I'm going to be okay. And I've always just said that. But I, I'm not really Tim Tebow, and I kind of got nervous when I was asked to be like Tim Tebow, because I, I, I really wasn't, and I was nervous and afraid of it. And I was going to give this speech, and I thought, well, I'm always telling these kids to love each other, and I know there's a, there, I know there's a time in Jesus' life where he says, just love each other. Just love each other like I've loved you. I knew that. I remember seeing that, right? And I was like, so I did what any good Christian would do, and I Googled it. John 13. Just love each other. And I remember like, wow. It started to hit me why I was so happy. Why, why I had this feeling like un, unlike any other time in my life, perhaps outside of my wedding day and the birth of my kids, every time I did this will to live stuff, I was on a different level. And it hit me. I have been preaching the gospel and I didn't know it. I had no idea. It never occurred to me. When I, when I said, remember 13, when I came up with love you, man, I didn't have a Bible open. And I started to think, well, wow, maybe it's not what I say, it's what you hear. And, and then I started thinking, when I, when I think of the music that I like, right? And, and, I, and I talk about this a lot. I, I think one church did a, did a thing, I'm a big Beatles fan, and they did a story about the Beatles and the gospel. Well, I'll tell you what, when John Lennon and Paul McCartney wrote All You Need Is Love, they did not have a Bible open. I'm pretty sure of it. But it's not what they wrote, it's what I hear. And love is all you need. And I challenge you guys to, to look for the gospel. What did Jesus tell us to do? He told us to love each other. You could wrap up the entire gospel into that. Love each other. Not just your friends. Love everyone. Love the person who just came into school, who you don't know. Love your enemies. All these things, it was just, and I remember thinking, wow, John 13, and I'm talking, remember 13, and my name's John. I'm like, and, and Tommy said to me, that was his verse when he got confirmed. He goes, dad, that's will to live. I'm like, maybe it's, maybe will to live is the gospel, Tommy. Maybe it's the other way around. And he went, yeah. And you could see it. You guys don't have to be Tim Tebow. You don't have to, to quote the Bible every time. What I'm asking you to do is deliver love. And when you do that, you'll feel better. Because this is what's happened to me. And, and I used to think, okay, I'd go to church every Sunday, and I would receive love. And the arrows were in, and I'd listen. And guys like Rocky would get up there, and they'd passionately deliver this sermon, and it would, it would be wonderful. And then I'd walk out and, and then go on with my week and come back next Sunday, and I'd receive love again. But with the foundation and with Will's death and with, with what I started to do, I realized I started to deliver the love, and I didn't even know I was doing it. And the arrows went out. And maybe that's my challenge for you guys to, to go, go away from here and, and have your arrows out. Have the love out. And if you want to quote the Bible, do it, but you don't have to. Just by loving and showing love and delivering love, you're honoring. You're honoring God and you're honoring Christ. And I never realized it. And I've never felt this way. 
and I've had a really good life. I've done a lot of really fun, wonderful things. But this is by far the best thing I've ever done. It took me a while to realize it. But right now, my arrows are out, and I'm having a blast. I really am. So I, I challenge you to not worry if you, you don't have to be the Tim Tebow. But when you drop a love you man on somebody, you're going to feel better. Because your friends need it. I've talked about the fact that you all have, like yourselves, you have friends that have bad days, that have not okay parts of their life. Be that friend that shows them what they're missing, shows them how green the grass is. If you do that, guys, you're giving of yourself. And when you give of yourself, you're honoring God, you're honoring your family, you're honoring your friends, and you're honoring yourself. And it's a wonderful feeling. And this concept of delivering hope, nobody can del deliver hope to your friends better than you can. So in honor of that, I want every single person in this room right now to turn to the person next to you and say, I love you, man. <laughs> I'll tell you what. All right, stop, 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 stop. Jeez. Happens every time. Love you, man. <laughs> All I did was say, turn to the person next to you and say, I love you, man. You guys start hugging each other. I did not ask you to do that. But you did it. And there's this wave of energy that goes through the room. That's what I'm trying to talk about. I used to think it was the, the, the receiver of the I love you transaction that was the benefactor. And I think I've learned that it's the giver. I want you to think about something. Picture Christmas morning, right? Christmas morning, those arrows are coming in and you're getting gifts and you're excited about their gifts. Isn't this fun? You're getting gifts and your parents give you gifts and your grandparents gifts, gifts, gifts. But there might be one gift that you actually picked out for somebody. In our house, you know, I could see, you know, hi mom, or this is to mom, love Tommy. Tommy has no idea what it is, right? Because I bought it at, you know, Creature Comfort or the heck she likes to shop, right? But there's always one gift that Tommy did buy at school and he wrapped it himself. And he goes, mom, 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 no, open this one, open this one, open this one, and you can see it. You can see it in his eyes. That's God. That's what I'm talking about. When you pick out that gift that you know someone you love is going to love and you give it to them and you're so excited to see them happy. That's Jesus. Look for that. And you will be, you will, you'll be on top of the mountain, guys. And you're listening to a guy who lost his son who at the same time is on the top of the mountain. And it's a strange, strange place for me to be. But it's wonderful. And that's probably the, the best advice I can give. Love each other. When you do that, you are going to feel better. And I just, I just, I'm honored to have been, to, to have watched you guys today standing back there when you guys were singing. Be somebody's harmony. Be that person who makes their friends sound a little bit better. That's my challenge. Be that person, you athletes, who makes the good pass. Be that person who, who gets the ground ball. Be that person who makes their friends feel better and look better. Be their harmony. Let them be the Melanie tomorrow you'll feel better doing it. Guys, I love you. I am, I'm excited about you. I'm excited about the opportunities that you have, and they're not going to be easy. But do it together, and you have fun. You see the World Series. You see the Super Bowl. You see what happens when you're on a team, and the team does well. They're there for each other. And when they do poorly, they're there for each other. You see them talk about, oh, this team has great chemistry. We just love each other. I love you, man. I love you, man. They're talking about it in the Super Bowl. It's all great, right? Now go watch Wimbledon. And there's a tennis player by himself, and he wins Wins Wimbledon. And he, and he, he like, okay, he shakes the other guy's hand, and he, 
he shakes the ref and he's got nobody to high five. He has to run up into the stands to hug his mother. When somebody asks you, what do you like about yourself? I love being on a team. I love being a teammate. That's going to help you your whole life. I promise you that. What kind of a teammate are you? Enjoy it. You'd much rather be that guy in the World Series who's hugging 30 guys that shared it with him than the poor, the poor slob tennis player that has no one to hug but his mom up in the stands. I did not mean to offend any tennis players in here, but it breaks my heart. I, it breaks my heart. He's gotta, but watch a college tennis team. Watch a college tennis team play. And they're all over each other. The concept of being on the team and sharing the good and sharing the bad and sharing the love is what we're all about. So I love you guys. Thank you so, so much. I'll leave this last slide up here. These are, the, these are your conversations you're going to have at your dinner table. Do you have friends? Well, you do have friends. Any of your friends going through something tough right now? The answer is yes. Be there for them. Help them. If you can get these kind of conversations, get you guys to talk about it, use me, mom and dad, use me, use my family, use will to live, use, use these concepts tonight to get these kids to talk to you. Because that's going to improve everybody's life if we do that. All right, gang, thank you so much. On February 1st is the 10th annual Where There's a Will, There's a Way 5K. It's a team theme. I want to see Team Grace Chapel running in that. I want all of you in it. It'll be a lot of fun. Thank you.